Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Today, our group will be present about Simon. Our group there's Audrey, me as Benedict, London, Major, and Kaya. Mm -hmm. Okay, the spinel or pangolin, also called a scaly ant, is a mammal of the fully dota order. One surviving family, Mandaji, has three generations, consisting of four species living in Asia. Patagonia is comprised of two species living in Africa, and Smutia of two living species also live in Africa. The species is different in size from 30 to 100 centimeters. A number of extension species are also known. The name pangolin comes from Malay bellows. Milling has been found naturally in tropical areas throughout Africa and Asia. Mm. This is what the penguin looks like. Then they can be found in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, a part of being a majestic and intriguing animal. The pangolin is the only scaly mammal. Their large extended paws are able to dig underground to make home and to pry through the entrance and of ants to pry to and termites that fit on it, while also making the soil both stirred and aerated. It enhances soil nutrition and helps the cycle of decomposition, which provides healthy substrates for the vegetation on it to grow. These solitary, primarily nocturnal animals are easily recognized by their full armor of scales. A startled pangolin will cover its head with its front legs, exposing its scales to any potential predator. If touched or grabbed, it will roll up completely into a ball. While the sharp scales on the tail can be used to lace out. Also called scaly indicators because of the of their pre preferred diet. Pangolins are the most trafficked mammal in the world, with demand primarily in Asia and in growing amounts in Africa for their meat and scales. There is also demand in the United States for pangolin products, particularly for their leather to be used in boots, bags, and belts. Jongiling is a type of solitary animal, nocturnal, which tends to pickner in the taste of the duration and prefer to wait to get what is preferred, then getting the food. The eight species of pangolin are not globally treated. This is fluid by an influx of critically Indian, of critically Indian species. There are over a million pangolin estimated as extract from the wild in recent years to meet the growing demand to their flesh, scales, and embryos. The pangolin is now the most illegally traded mama on earth. The product of the pangolin was sold by some to have magical and medical efficacy. Uh, and with ancient species on brink of extinction, demand has now shifted to the African pangolin. Thank you for listening our presentation. Okay, great. Thank you for Audrey, Benedict, uh, London, Mega, and Michaela for your presentation about pangolin. Yeah. So the first time I saw that pangolin, it, uh, is it penguin? But it's really different. Yeah. That's the animals. It's a really a uh, family in uh, Africa. Yeah. So great. Thank you so much for having this uh, great presentation. Yeah. You uh, tell uh, uh, about the uh, general uh, structure, or I mean, the uh, classification of the uh, of that pangolin. Yeah? Uh, when we talk about the report text, that we talk things related to the information that we got from the things, yeah? like uh, animals or uh, plants or any kinds of objects. Yeah, good job. Any questions uh, comes from comes from the participant? Yeah, hello. 
the audience, do you want to ask some question about this uh, project or about this presentation? Yeah, I give you time to have questions for that. Okay. <laughs> okay, they, maybe they get tired. Yeah, maybe this is still morning. They have no, uh, no uh, uh, conversation that's something that they're going to ask you. Okay, we go for the next uh, the center. Okay, who is ready for the next? I, I gave you, uh, I didn't have to point you, but if uh, you are freely uh, to have the second uh, presenter, go ahead. Hello. Or maybe uh, Michaela, Audrey, Benedict, London, and uh, uh, make a point, uh, the next presenter, maybe you can discuss who's going to do, I give you time to have. Hello, hello, hello. And Luis is uh, uh, okay. Uh, did you get um information from Luis? Uh, no, sir. Okay, thank you. I, I report the score for you to this attendance. Luis Lee. Okay. Um. Uh, Who is going to do next? Uh, maybe uh, Audrey or Nathans. Are you going to point the next students? Kelompoknya uh, Stella, sir. Oh, Stella. Okay, good. Thanks so much, uh, Audrey. Hello, Stella. Are you there, Stella? Yes, sir. Okay, Stella, are you ready? Ah, thank you, Stella. Okay. Yeah, I give you time to prepare about it, Stella. Yeah, okay. Let's start, Stella. Time is yours. Okay. Oh, Colleen, Stella. Oh, uh, wait. I have to write down her name first. Stella, Colleen, uh, Geneva, Natalia, Ruby. Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Today yeah. we will be showing off our presentation on dog breeds so without any further ado let's get started what are dogs the dog or domestic dog is a domesticated descendant of the wolf which is char characterized by an upturning tail the dog derived from an ancient extinct wolf extinct wolf and the modern gray wolf is the dog's nearest living relative the dog was the first ever species to be dom domesticated by hunter-gatherers over 15,000 years ago, before the development of agriculture. There are around 450 or more dog breeds, so we'll, we'll only be able to talk about only some of them today, but I hope you will be satisfied with the dogs we choose to present. The first dog we are going to be presenting is the Siberian Husky. Oh. Siberian Huskies are originated in Northeast Asia, where they are bred by the Chukchi people of Siberia for sled pulling and companionship. It, it is an active, energetic, resilient breed whose ancestors lived in the extremely cold and harsh environment of the Siberian Arctic. Arctic. William Gusak, a Russian fur, tra fur trader, introduced them to to Nome, Alaska, during the name Gold Rush. Initially, a sled dogs to work the mining fields and for expeditions through otherwise impossible terrain. Today, the Siberian Husky is typically kept on, uh, kept as a house pet. Though they are still frequently used as sled dogs by competitive and rec recreational mushers. Siberian Huskies have a very dense plush coat with plenty of undercoat. A small ruff around a small ruff is found around the neck, but no long fringes on the legs or tail. Color ranges from black to white and everything in between. Most dogs do have white markings, particularly on the chest and legs. The husky has traits which are intelligent, outgoing, friendly, alert, and gentle. Here's some basic information about the husky. 
Oh, good. Nice talk. Next. Um, and uh, Tari, Tari. Tari. your Tari. mic isn't working. Um, I will also be showing off the Labrador Retriever. The Labrador, Labrador Retriever's history began at the 19th century when a number of, number of St. John's dogs were imported to the Dorset area of England. Once in England, the dogs were soon spotted by English aristocrats who, when observing their considerable stamina, loyalty, skill in the water, and innate retrieving drive, recognized their suitability for working with the gentry in their favorite sport of hunting waterfowl. It's alleged that the East Earl of Malmesbury became, became intrigued by the breed during a visit to Dorset after seeing a St. John's dog retrieve a fish that a fisherman had thrown from his boat. He immediately requested some more, some for himself, and soon he dedicated his entire breeding kennels into St. John's dog, dogs. A few years later, the Earl of Malmesbury donated some of his stack to the fifth and sixth Dukes of Buccleuch, who started to breed the dogs in the now famous Buccleuch breeding program in the 1880. This breeding program is widely considered the place from which the true ancestors of today's Labrador Retriever hail. The St. John's dogs numbers steadily declined over the decades until it finally became extinct in the 1980s. Two theories of how they became known as Labrador Retrievers are, first, they were merely named after the region where they originated in the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. The second is the Spanish and Portuguese term for workers or laborers is Labrador, Labradores and Labradores Respectively also, respectively, also within Portugal, there is a village called Cas Castra Laboreiro, where a breed of dogs protecting livestock look very similar to the St. John's dog. So the name may have por Portuguese origins, we will never truly be truly sure. The Labrador is loyal, obedient, and playful. It was bred as a sporting and hunting dog, but is widely kept as a companion dog. It may also be trained as a guide or assistance dog or for rescue or therapy work. Labradors are a medium large breed. They should be as long as, as long from the withers to the base of the tail as they are from the floor to the withers. The AKC, AKC standard includes an ideal weight for dogs of 25 to 36 kilograms and for bitches as 25 to 32 kilograms. The coat is water resistant, so the dog does not get cold when talking to, when taking to water in the winter. That means that the dog naturally has a slight dry oily coat. Acceptable colors are black, yellow, and chocolate. The head should be broad with slightly pronounced eyebrows. The eyes should be kind and expressive, Appropriate eye colors are brown and hazel. The lining around the eyes should be black. The ears should hang close to the head and set slightly above the eyes. The jaw should be strong and powerful. The muzzle should be, should be of medium length and should not be too, too toppered. The jaw should long slightly and curve gracefully back. The body should have a powerful and mus muscular build. The trait, the tail and coat, are designated to designated distinctive or distinguishing features of the Labrador by both the Kennel Club and AKC. The AKC adds that true Labrador retriever temperament is as, as much of a hail mark of the breed as the otter tail.
Nice dog. Thank you. And the next food dog breed is Poodle. Did you guys know that Poodle is one of the most popular dogs? The breed is divided into four varieties based on size. The standard Poodle, medium Poodle, miniature Poodle, and toy Poodle. Poodle have become popular companion dogs. All of them are judged by the same standard of appearance, which call for a well-proportioned dog with a long, straight muzzle, heavily haired hanging ears, a dog pom-pom tail, and a characteristic springy gait and a broad manner of carrying itself. The coat consists of a woolly under undercoat and a dense wiry top coat. If allowed to grow, the hair forms like forms stroke like cords, and the dog is called a corded poodle. The coat should be solid, not variegated, and maybe any of a number of colors among them: gray, white, black, brown, apricot, and cream. In the late 20th century, breeders began to cross poodle with other purebred dogs in what was called the designer dog. The goal was the incorporation into a, the offspring of poodle into the gens and not shedding coat. All sizes of poodle were crossed with other breeds, resulting in such breed as the Labradoodle, Estrabadol, Retriever, Post Poodle, Pikapu is Pekingis, Post Poodle, and many more others. However, many poodle breeders deplore the trend and regret the dilution of carefully managed bloodlines. Kintamani, as the name implies, this dog may come from the Kintamani area of Bali. A medium sized dog with a strong bone and muscle, with a brave, alert nature, having a high level of suspicion, but being very loyal to the Ata. The Kintamani dog is suitable to be a guard dog and life partner because Kintamani has a very long lifespan for a cycle dog, which is around 20 years. This dog, which can be only found in mountain areas surrounded by forests and half of the mountains, has been recognized as a pure breed dog by the International Psychology Federation in 2019. Kintamani weighs around 50 kg, officially recognized as a white, and has a double coat. Kintamani belongs to three group dog because it has similar characteristics to Samaya, Chocha, and the other three group dog. Shiba Inu is a breed of hunting dog from Japan, a small to medium breed. It is the smallest of the six original and distinct species breed of dog native to Japan. It looks similar to and is often mistaken for other Japanese dog breeds, like, such as the Akita Inu or Hokkaido. But the Shiba Inu is a distinct breed with a distinct bloodline, temperament, and smaller size than other Japanese dog breeds. This breed originated in Japan some 3,000 years ago, originally Shiba Inu was found for ground bird hunting. A muscular dog, it is 10, 33 until 41 centimeter tall at the shoulders at, and weight 9 to uh, four, 14 kilograms. The Shiba Inu is known for its temper, perkiness, and triangular set eye. Its coat is short, flush, and straight with harsh undercoat and maybe white mixed with either red, ginger, tan, or light black. Highly active, the Shiba Inu loves the outdoors and cold weather. Although the breed faced extinction during World War II, its numbers have dramatically rebounded. The Shiba Inu is perhaps the most popular dog in Japan and was introduced in the United States in the 1950s. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Great. Thank you for Shell, Stella, Colleen, Jennifer, Natalia, and Ruby for dog breed. You know, one of yours uh, presenting about Kintamani. Yeah. Uh, I just tell you a little bit about Kintamani. Yeah? When I was in Bali around 2004, because I was staying there for two years, and I ever uh, visit Kintamani. Yeah? Uh, so they have the big dog. Great. Yeah. 
really nice. Okay, any question from other groups to uh, about uh, the first presenter? Hello. No. Okay, do you have, uh, Nicholas, do you have any question about the first presenter? No. Hmm? The second presenter? No. No, no. no. okay. No question. Okay, any other question from the other groups? Um, hello. We still have two groups, yeah, two more groups. Hello. Uh, Colin, can you uh, help me to uh, stop sharing, please? Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Stella, Colin, Jennifer, Natalie, Ruby, yeah, you have done your well presentation about uh, this uh, dog bridge. Okay, any other groups want to present about Today's hello. Maybe one one group, one more group. I think. Stella, do you want to point X students to have certainly? Oh, okay, Natalie. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay. No words, Natalie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even though you are not speak, uh, you are not uh, giving your present uh, present me about this part, but oh, <laughs> Natalie. Okay, do you want to do it? Okay, go ahead. I give you time. <laughs> okay, Natalie, go ahead. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Okay, now I can hear clearly. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Okay, um, just my part. Yes, yeah, yeah, just in your part. This okay. Yeah, I need to listen about your. Uh, okay, go. Mm -hmm. Library retrieve first, like every retrieve first, started from St. John's dog. Their history began at the 19th century, when a number of St. John's dogs were imported to the Dorset area of England. They were spotted and observed by English aristocrats and got recognized for their suitability for hunting waterfalls. A breeding program made by Earl Malesbury is widely considered the place from which the true ancestor of today's library first here. Here, the St. John's dog numbers steadily declined over the decades until it finally became extinct in the 80s. The lepers are, are loyal, obedient, and playful. They were bred as sporting and hunting dogs, but are widely kept as companion dogs. They can also be trained as guide or assistance dog or for rescue or therapy work. The lepers are a medium large breed. They are water resistant. They have Broad head with slightly pronounced eyebrows. They should have strong jaws and should have a powerful and muscular build. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Natalie Chokro, yeah, for your time for having this one. Good job. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's have for another group who's. Uh, Natalie, do you want to point another uh, group to have their presentation? Colleen, do you have any? Timothy's. Huh? Okay, Timothy's. I have done it, sir. Oh yeah, yeah wait, wait, I have, oh yeah, Timothy have done. Timothy's, oh, wait, Jonathan, Kathleen, Kane, Ryan, Timothy's. Vincent, Shane, Francisco, Rainer, Keegan, Audrey, Benedict, London, uh, Mega, Michael, Stella, Colin, Jennifer, Natalie, Rabi. So the other groups, please. Who's going to give the presentation? Hello. <laughs> huh? uh, yes, I am present. Okay, Nicholas, are you ready? Hi, Nicholas. So, Ready when you are. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, I give you time to prepare about the presentation. Okay. 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 Go ahead, Nicholas. Let me know about your uh, members. Yeah, Nicholas. You. Nicholas is in my group, sir. Oh, Valerie. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the, um, I need this group uh, for our last uh, meeting. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Nicholas Valerie, okay, go ahead. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. 
and Grassley Valerie. Um, okay, is my screen visible? Ah, uh, yes, visible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I'll start with um, our presentation today is about a report text that we will be presenting. So first of all, uh, wait a minute. Our group uh, consists of first Aurelius, but he is not able to be here because he is sick apparently. Mm -hmm. um, we have Justin, uh, Nicolas, Charlene, and me, myself, uh, Valerie. Okay. So today, what we will be, be presenting of is what is it about? Secondly, the characteristic of, of it. The third one is the structure. The fourth one is the process. And the fifth one is the final result. OK, so today we will be presenting about volcanoes. I'm so sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Never worries. Okay, okay. Uh, so a volcano is a rupture in the crust of planetary mass object, such as earth that allows hot lava, volcanic ash and gases to escape from a magma chamber below the surface. On earth, volcanoes are most often found where tectonic plates are diverging on or converging, and most are found underwater. Many mountains formed by folding, faulting, uplift, and erosion of the Earth's crust. Volcanic terrain, however, is built by the slow accumulation of erupted lava. The vent may be visible as a small bowl-shaped depression at the summit of a cone or shield-shaped mountain. Through a series of cracks within and beneath the volcano, the vent connects to one or more linked storages areas of molten or partially molten rock, which is magma. This connection to fresh magma allows the volcano to erupt over and over again in the same location. In this way, the volcano grows even larger until it is no longer stable. Pieces of the volcano collapse as rocks falls or as landslides. Okay. The next one is a volcanic eruption. A volcanic eruption is when lava and gas are released from a volcano, sometimes explosively. The most dangerous type of eruption is called a glowing avalanche, which is when freshly erupted magma flows down the, the sides of a volcano they can travel quickly and reach the temperature up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Other ha hazards include ashfall and lahars, which is mud or debris flows. Volcanoes often cause population displacement and food shortages. The next one uh, we'll be talking about the characteristic. Um, the first characteristic of a volcano is formed by eruptions of lava and ash. Secondly, volcanoes are usually cone-shaped mountain or hills. Third, um, when magma reaches the Earth's surface, it is called lava. When the lava cools, it forms rock. Uh, the fourth one is volcanic eruption can happen at destructive and constructive boundaries, but not at a conservative boundaries or collision zones. The last one is some volcanoes happen underwater along the seabed or ocean floor. Next part, I will explain about the structure of the volcano and what does it look like. A volcano consists of three main parts. The first part is the crater. The crater is a depression at the top of the volcano from which volcanic material has been ejected. The second part is the vent, the conduit between the crater and the magma. And the third part, third part is the cone, the area around the crater at the top of the volcano made up of material ejected during an eruption. Many volcanoes have several craters, cones, and vents. 
Volcanoes have been described as inherently unstable structures, vulnerable to landslides and collapses. According to an article in Natural History magazine, they are made of intermixed layers of solid lava and flows and fragmented materials, all of which has been weakened by hot gases and fluids and shaken by earthquakes. A host of other factors contribute to their instability, such as steep slopes, stress that arises from faulting, and from the intrusion of hot magma into vertical fractures or dikes and weak sloping foundations. Some volcanoes have lava tubes. Lava tube is an unusual environment. They are empty caverns that are not penetrated by rainstorm or roots and thus experience no erosion. Hardened drops of lava hang from the ceiling like stalactites, and floors and floor, the floor often looks like sour, solidified bubbling porridge. In places where there is a drop off, there is a solid cascade. Okay, um, next, I'm gonna be explaining about the process of volcanic eruption. Deep within the earth, it is so hot that some rocks slowly melt and become a thick flowing substance called magma. Since it's lighter than the solid rock around it, magma rises and collects in magma chambers, which you can see right here. Eventually, when some of the magma some of the magma pushes through vents and fissures to the Earth's surfaces. Magma that has erupted is called lava. Some volcanic eruptions are explosive and others are not. Explosivity of an eruption depends on the composition of the magma. If the magma is thin and runny, gases can escape easily from it. When this type of magma erupts, it flows out it flows out of the volcano. A good example is the eruption of at Hawaii's volcanoes. Lava flows rarely kill people because they move slowly enough for people to get out of their way. If magma is thick and sticky, gases escape easily. Pressure builds up until the gases escape violently and explodes. A good example is the eruption of Washington's Mount St. Helens. In this type of eruption, the magma blasts into the air and break apart into pieces called tephra. Tephra can range in size from tiny particles of ash to house-sized boulders. Explosives of volcanic eruption can be dangerous and deadly. They can blast out crowds of hot tephra from the side or top of the mountain. These fiery clouds race down mountain slides, destroying almost everything in their path. Ashes erupted into the sky and fell back onto earth like powdery snow. If thick enough, blankets of ash can suffocate plants, animals, and humans. When hot volcanic material mixed with water from steams or melted snow and ice, mud flows form. Mud flows have buried entire communities locating near erupting volcanoes, such as Pompeii. Okay, lastly, I'm going to explain about the final result after a volcanic eruption. Volcanoes spew hot, dangerous gases, ash, lava, and rocks that are powerfully destructive. People have died from volcanic blasts. Volcanic eruptions can result in additional threats to health, such as floods, mudslides, power outages, drinking water contamination, and wildfires. Health concerns after a volcanic eruption include infectious disease, respiratory illness, burns, injuries from falls, and vehicle accidents related to the slippery, hazy conditions caused by ash. When warnings are heeded, the chances of adverse health effects from a volcanic eruption are very low. Volcanic ash. Exposure to ash can be harmful. Infants, elderly people, and people with respiratory conditions such as asthma, emphysema, and other chronic lung diseases may have problems if they breathe in volcanic ash. Ash is gritty, abrasive, and sometimes corrosive, and always unpleasant. Small ash particles can abrade the front of the eye. 
Ash particles may contain crystalline silica, a material, a material that causes a respiratory disease called silicosis. Gases. Most gases from a volcano quickly blow away. However, heavy gases such as carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide can collect in low-lying areas. The most common volcanic gas is water vapor, followed by carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide can cause breathing problems in both pe healthy people and people with asthma and other respiratory problems. Other volcanic gases include hydrogen chloride, mon carbon monoxide, and hydrogen fluoride. Amounts of these gases vary widely from one volcanic eruption to the next. Although gases usually blow away rapidly, it is possible that people who are close to the volcano or who are in the low-lying areas downwind may be exposed to levels that may affect health. At low levels, gases can irritate the eyes, nose, and throat. At higher levels, gases can cause rapid breathing, headache, dizziness, swelling, and spasm of the throat, and suffocation. That's it for our presentation. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? That's great, yeah, for Nicolas, Valerie, uh, Serline, and Justin, yeah, for your um, topics about volcano, yeah. I think uh, that's a brief, uh, brief report about, uh, we talk about volcano, yeah, so it means really uh, informative, yeah. Um, even you are in a science class, but this volcano, uh, this subject, yeah, this topic is, uh, Started by the social class, yeah. But um, wait. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um. Any questions from other groups about this volcano uh, presentation? Hello. Mm, questions. Huh? Any questions? Okay, no. Okay, so let me recap about the, today's uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, the first uh, the first group they uh, talk about pangolin. The second group is talk about <coughs> the <dope> reason. <coughs> Sorry, I got a uh, problem. Uh, the first group uh, has have already um, has already uh, present about Pangolin, Dog Bridge, and the third for the work canal. So uh, today uh, we only uh, did three topics yeah about this part. So uh, the next meeting, the last meeting, yeah, we will still have one group yeah one group uh, left. So I do hope the next meeting for our last presentation. And after that, I will give you some exercise or something related to our topic, yeah? So when we talk about report tags, we talk something related to our direct and indirect speech, yeah? Something we talk, when we listen about the information from someone and then we give, uh, we forward the message and it means that um, we do the report, yeah? Something related direct and indirect speech. So that's all for three groups have uh, presented about this one. I'm really grateful, I'm really happy. You have done well about your presentation. Uh, so I think that's enough for us for today's class. Uh, if there is no more questions, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for the captain for Kane, yeah. Already uh, conduct the class and so you all come to this class. Actually from Aurelius, yeah. He uh, asked for permission, and Louis Lee, yeah. Louis Lee is uh, really uh, late come to this class, eh, Louis, yeah. What happened with you, Luis? Hey, Luis, you came late for this job, yeah? Okay, um, because we start the class opening by Timothy, and I need uh, Timothy, point the next student to close this meeting by closing prayer. Time is yours, Timothy. <laughs> Hi, Timothy. Hi. Uh -huh.
I need you to, to point next to them to lead the Stella, sir. Huh? Yeah? Stella. Oh, Stella. Okay, thank you. Too much. Hello, Stella. Hi, Stella. And that's free. Okay. Terima kasih, Tuhan, telah memberkati kami dari awal pelajaran hingga akhir. Sekarang kami ingin menghasilkan kegiatan kami. Tolong berkati kami agar kegiatan kami semua lancar. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you so much, Stella. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for having this class with me. Enjoy your time. God bless you and I'll see you next meeting with good condition. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stella. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, thank you. Yeah, God bless you all. Yeah. Good. Uh,